Hi, everyone. Welcome to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy. Today, we are talking with a teacher about one of our most requested topics of all time, vocabulary instruction. Yeah, so exciting. And we're here to talk with Sean Morrissey, who is a fifth grade teacher from Western New York, not New York City, just (laughs) make sure. Um, And he caught our eye on Twitter with a lot of uh, suggestions he was giving for vocabulary. So we cannot wait to talk to him today. So welcome, Sean. Ah, Thanks. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. Yeah, well, we're glad you're here. And I know today we're going to talk a lot about tier two words, also known as academic vocabulary, and a little bit about tier three words or content specific words. But Sean, since you're the teacher expert here today, I would love for you to start us off by sharing a bit more about generally like tier one, two, and three words. All right. So I think we're kind of going to uh, bringing words to life. Um, So tier one words are just basic words that like are high frequency Kids know a lot. They're using a lot in, in language. Ball, horse, you know, run, shoe. So words that are used often. So kids pick up on those words pretty pretty quickly. Um, tier three words are content words. So we're talking about like science, social studies, content words. Words like isotope, tundra. Um, like I teach photosynthesis in fifth grade. Um, alveoli, where alveoli. It's very specific. Oh, to um, yes. yeah, you guys so <laughs> respiratory system uh, <laughs> so when you teach the respiratory system you have to teach the alveoli you know it's where gas is exchanged you know with um, your circulatory system so those are very content specific words um, tier two words are words that are really really important they you know fall in science social studies um, literature they're used in multiple domains. They have like, I would say high utility too. Like words like feature, function, um, abundant, contradict. So words that kind of go in many, many different areas. My favorite, fa- I have a, actually I have a favorite vocabulary word. Um, <laughs> it's, it's contract or we could say contract. So mm. like, you know, it's, you know, it's used in fifth grade. It's used um, in many different areas. So, like, I, like with 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 contract, it, it falls under when when I teach uh, about the eyes. Like, your pupils are contracting. It falls under muscles where you know your muscles are contracting or you're contracting an illness. And like, you start teaching about the constitution. Like, you know, some people will say it's a social contract. So, mm-hmm. like, that's my favorite word. It comes up. Kids probably read that word at least a hundred or more times throughout throughout the year, so it's a good word to teach. So neat. Before we move on from this, I just want to—you mentioned bringing words to life. Do you want to talk a little, just in case people don't know uh, that book? You want to... Oh my goodness! I don't... <laughs> oh, he has so, it. Uh, Hold it up! It Hold so... it up! <laughs> uh, so, um, anybody watching on YouTube can uh, can get that it, cover in their mind for yeah, their purchase. Right there. Um, honestly, like for the people, I mean, a lot of your l- listeners, um, you know, the writing revolution was like, like the book that came out for writing that was so, you know, it, that kind of changed people's practice, like bringing words to life. I think the first edition came out in 2002. So, um, you know, Beck McCowan, um, Margaret's great. I think she's retired now. She does a lot of podcasts now. They are just, I think more the, the experts on how to, um, teach vocabulary in the classroom. So it's a book that I've read, reread. Um, it's actually when I when I changed from being I was formerly a school psychologist and I changed to the classroom. I did I had to do an observation and uh, I did an observation using um, one of their lesson plans. So it got me the job. So <laughs> yes, it's a good sign. Uh, po- first grade, a pocket a pocket for corduroy. So I still remember the words drowsy reluctant those are the words i taught for the lesson so that's that. great <laughs> all right so now we know the different types of words that exist in the world <laughs> as a teacher i think the one of the biggest questions is okay i have a text in front of me how do i pick which words to teach um uh-huh. so can you talk us through like what should teachers be thinking about? And I think if you're if you're okay with it, if you're ready for it, we asked if you might be able to walk through an example even. 
Sure, if, sure. If you so, don't have that, that's okay. <laughs> no, no, I got. I, I have an. I have an example for you. Yeah, so right. I think when you think about like what words to teach, like it's it's hard because you're talking about like if people are new to this, new teachers and that, like you know when you're like oh function, that's a tier two word. Um, I go back to some of the mainstays out there. So the academic word list um, is great. So it it was formalized like 20 years ago. It's called Coxeed's Academic Word List, and these are like over 500 words that come up a lot in different domains of science and social studies. So I've actually like years and years ago, I kind of studied that list a little bit. So I kind of had those those words ingrained. So that's that's one of the one of the like lists that kind of helped me. Um, they also have like a general service list, which is like the most frequent words that happen in the English language. So one summer I went through like the top 3,000 most frequent words and I'm like, ooh, which one of these words would fifth graders may not know? So I kind of just, I typed them up in a spreadsheet and there's like 400 that more of those words came up. Um, you know, there's other websites that are great where like they kind of structure like what words are important. Text projects, great. Um, Alfreda Hybert's work. Mm -hmm. um, so um, word generation through the SERP Institute is also an uh, amazing website. Um, so those are like the four th like things that kind of structured, you know, and kind of gave me like, oh, these are these are a lot, a lot of words to focus on. So that's kind of where, where I started like my journey for sure. Yeah. So. Can I throw one more in? Just sure. I like it. <laughs> There's um, on um, Achieve the Core or Student Achievement mm -hmm. Partners on their website, there's an academic word finder. And you can take, like, if you can cut and paste the text, which I know you can't yeah. always, but you can cut and paste the text, put it right in there, and it will just tell you which 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 words are academic words for which grade, or you can put in a grade level and it will tell you which ones match for that grade level and, like, one above and one below. And it's a really nice starting point. Not the end-all, be-all. You don't, you know, you Obviously, you're the teacher. You can <laughs> decide yeah. whether those are the right words or there are other words. But it's a really nice starting point if you're kind of stuck for where to go. Yeah. There, there's, there's one more. Uh, also, word sift is another one. So if you, you do the same thing, you can, on a PDF, you can cut and paste the, the text. And you can click a button where it tells you which words fall under the academic word list. So, yeah. so I've used that before nice. as well. Yeah. yeah. And we'll link all these, right, Lori, in our show notes? Yes, I was thinking as the person who is doing the linking, wow, you're making my job really difficult. And I'm glad you're making it difficult because now we're sharing all of these resources with our yeah. fabulous yeah. teacher list. Every, every teacher is like, what was that website? I need, I want it. All in our show notes. In the show notes, we'll also blast on social, as we always do, for really cool tools. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a rookie. This is my first podcast. So I always wanted to say it's going to be in the show notes. So, <laughs> oh yeah, go. You want to say it? Go ahead. Yes, it, uh, Sean. It's be in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> awesome. All right, Sean. Do you want to walk us through an example now? Sure. So, so I have a text from um, one of the curriculums I use, one of the novel studies, so the Re Reading Reconsidered curriculum where um so the the main novel is number of the stars so this is just a short um, non-fiction passage to accompany number of the stars so it's called danish resistance to nazi germany okay all right you ready 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 okay. all right so okay at the beginning of world war ii the scandinavian countries of denmark sweden and norway declared their neutrality that means they would not take sides in the conflict with memories of the damage of World War I still fresh in the memories of many Danes, the government thought that by staying out of the war, their citizens would be safe. This, however, was not to be the case. The morning of April 9, 1940, German forces crossed the border into Denmark. German soldiers began going ashore at the docks of Copenhagen. Because of the speed of the German invasion, the Danish government did not have enough time to officially declare war on Germany. After two hours, the Danish government surrendered, believing that fighting was useless and hoping to work out an agreement with Germany. Last little paragraph here. During the occupation, however, many Danish citizens attempted to resist German occupation, typically in secret. For the first years of the occupation, active resistance activities were few and consisted mostly of the production of underground newspapers meant to spread news the Germans would not have wanted the population to know about. 
However, in 1942 to 43, resistance operations gradually shifted to more violent action, most notably acts of sabotage. Some resistance fighters set to fire to a stock of German listening devices. Others attacked factories that made German goods for the German military or blew up railroads. The Germans needed to move troops and supplies. Thanks. Were you writing words down, Laurie? I was. I have a whole list. <laughs> I was too. <laughs> now I feel like I need to sift through Is and think. Uh, yeah, is, are, we, are you going to quiz us, Sean, about which words? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like sure. I, what words did you like? What words did you write down? We'll see how we how we both fare here. You want to start, Larry? You want me to start? <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'm just trying to think about what. Uh, are we choosing a number? Are we going to choose a couple or just lists? Like, I have a ton. I also well, think I'll there's so much it. knowledge that we need, and also I'm going to mm-hmm. name that it's paired with a text. True. So, like, I was thinking... On its own, yes. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the knowledge first, and then we can go into the vocabulary? Because I think so many times these, like, seep over into each other, and it's really hard to parse out. Is that okay? Yeah, for sure. So, I think, like, with with, with this novel unit, everything's just... Uh, everything slowly builds. So, this is not just a random passage, like picked right. out so like the kids before even reading this passage there they already have a bunch of background so you know they do a very nice job with their curriculum development where they slowly build things up so it's not just like i mean all like just the, the content and the knowledge for fifth grade that's pretty hard um so if you kind of see it more in in the big picture when you're actually teaching it it it, it there's a lot of scaffolds in place for the kids for sure okay yeah. And we know that Number of the Stars, do you want to just give a quick little snapshot for those listening who maybe are unfamiliar with Number of the Stars? Yeah, so Number of the Stars is just one of those texts that was written many, many years ago. It's kind of an iconic text where it takes place during World War II. And um, the, 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 the Nazis, the Germans, they occupied Denmark and um, it was trying to lead, you know, uh, Jewish people out of Denmark. So there's, you know, probably about 8,000 Jews that were safely fled Denmark due to the help of the Den- due to the Den- to the Danish people. So it's a, it's a great fifth grade story that kind of it's a nice like introductory topic to World War II and the Holocaust for sure. Thank you for that. Yeah, so there's knowledge that they have. This text is not like a cold text. So that's kind of helpful at least for me thinking about it as, you know, teacher hat on like they're not going into this text cold. Um oh. I know some of the things, like some of the geography terms you were talking about, I was like, okay, they need, they, they should be able to visualize, right, what's happening there. But that, I don't know that that's necessarily vocabulary per se. I'd put that more in the background knowledge category or like the building knowledge category. Um, okay, so I'll throw out a couple words. Melissa, you want to like agree or disagree? <laughs> sure. All right. <laughs> go for Since it. you're making me go first. All right, here we go. I mean, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All right. Uh, surrendered. I had it on my list, but I didn't put it in my top five. Oh, <laughs> wow. My top four. Sorry, I did top four. Oh, gosh. Okay. I Occupation. Yeah, I had that one. Especially because I, I think of that as kind of like your contract word and contract, Sean. Like they might mm-hmm. know it, but in a different way. Correct. That's why it made my list as well. <laughs> How about underground? I did not have that. I had that because they thought they might not Similar understand reason. the secrecy of it. Yeah. Right. Or like think it's like literally underground. Underground. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you want to share a couple that you have now? And I'll yeah, yeah. agree. Or, okay. Um, resist and resistance I heard a few times. And mm-hmm. a similar like... You know, they might know it in one way, but maybe not how it's used in this text. And um, declare, I heard a couple times too. So I was, I had that one. And neutrality, I thought that was an important word. Oh, I didn't have neutrality. I must have missed that along the way. But I did have declare. You're probably writing out another word down. Yeah, that's <laughs> frantic in my list over here. Declare. <laughs> All right, Sean. How did how do we do? Did we pass, uh, fail. You, what happened? I would say you, you. you you, you, you pass for sure. So, 
<laughs> occupation's a great word. It, that falls on the academic word list. So, um, but oh. like, yes, yeah, so it's a multi, it's a, you know, multiple meaning word. Most kids know occupation maybe first as like, it's kind of your job. job. So yeah. um, f- for sure. Resistance is, I think, an important word because in the context of World War II, that word's going to come up a lot. So for like, sure. you, like, you know, like knowledge and vocabulary reciprocal in, ma- in many ways, like that's like a reciprocal relationship, like, you know, resistance, you're going to, you're going to hear that word um, a lot. You know, uh, declares a good word, like it's a, like, it's more of a more sophisticated way to say announce, but like when you declare something, you're like, it's, you're announcing something, but like you're usually declaring it to a lot of people. You're announcing it mm-hmm. to a lot of people like formally. Yeah. Um, I would, I would say sabotage would probably be a I word that, that one. yeah, <laughs> just, just because that's a, oh, I, I wrote that word. down last uh, yes. in the context. <laughs> um, but as you can yeah. see, like, you know, there's there, like that is packed with vocabulary. Now, yeah. th- like, you know, t- teachers out there where, you know, they're going to say like, ooh, that's going to be like, that, that might be too difficult. You know, I, personally, I think if we'd ever expose the kids to something like this, they're never going to like really improve like their 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 ability to read nonfiction and that. So um, I, I, I like pushing the envelope there. I think, you know, th- it's scaffolded that they get a lot from before, but like the kids read occupation, I think it came up three times. Resistance came up numerous times as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. so I'm like counting the number of words I wrote down. I ended up with a total of 12. And I'm yeah. thinking about, I, I mean, I actually recently read Number of the Stars. I have a fifth grader who just, I guess, an inc- going to into sixth grade. Um, and so <laughs> when she was in fifth grade, we read Number of the Stars together. And, um, I, so just kind of that book is fresh in my mind is my point. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking about some of these words on this list. And if I have students who I know have that knowledge and have already encountered some of this vocabulary, it, I would say it does take about half of these words off this list, which then cuts right. down significantly the, you know, the, the vocabulary that they need to understand for this particular piece. Also, they have this other built knowledge because they've read this other book and they have an understanding of what's happening and th- I think that that's just like you said it's very reciprocal it feeds off each other so if I'm you know, I, I love the idea of challenging students here because this is yeah. a place where they could be pushed and challenged because they do have the knowledge in order to step into it am I hearing that right Sean yeah like even like um, I would just think in some of these words like um, occupation um, and resistance Th- these are words that have come up before this passage numerous times so like, you know, so they, you're not going to spend a lot. This is more like they're, 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 it's more like retrieval practice. They're reading the words in context. It's just another, you know, another exposure to the word. You're like those two, you probably, like, I'm, I'm not teaching those two words at this point because they've, we've already discussed those words. Yeah. And I was thinking, Sean, words like that too, maybe even if they hadn't heard the word before, they probably get the idea of it from that other book, right? So even if they hadn't heard that this is, of resistance, right? They they might know what it, kind of what it means. So it might be a really uh-huh. quick like, oh, you know what this is from Number of the Stars. I'm just putting a word to it now that you already understand the concept of, yeah. which makes it a lot a lot easier for them. Yeah, you can't like well, well as we as we talk, you can't teach every word out there. So there's like right. you're you're going to teach some words more in depth. You're going to teach more words just like as they s- sort of come up quickly. Um, because there's just, there's just, we'll talk about that. There's just not enough time. That's the yep. hardest part of being a teacher. <laughs> you know, we, 100%. there's time, time limits. All the research will tell us, well, this works, this works, this works. Okay. But we do have time limits. That's, uh, <laughs> like no one talks about that. Like there, no. there's time restrictions. So what's going to give us like our best bets, you know, that, that are going to help students. All right. So should we talk about that now? So it's like, what now that we know the words to teach what are research based methods for mm-hmm. teaching these words and Sean i think you named some great words that we pulled out of this passage so if we were going to teach these in our classroom yeah. how should we do it what are some efficient ways to do it yeah so i think first i think we talk about like explicit instruction first so words that you know i'm going to teach you know kind of introduce the words explicitly um, you know there are some definite best bets on when you introduce words. 
So like introducing the word, writing it down, saying the word. So like we well, can talk about the word feature. So I'll have feature on the whiteboard. Okay, you know, this is the word that we're learning today. It's feature. What's the word class? You know, they would repeat feature just as like an attention, kind of an Inanita Archer explicit instruction, um, that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, so th then they're thinking about feature. Then we like definitely putting the words in multiple contexts. So, like, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example, like with, with, with feature here. So, explicit instruction. Here's here's a first context. Many animals, bird, many animals, birds, and people are carnivorous, which means they eat meat. You might be surprised to learn that some plants, like the Venus flytrap and the pitcher plant, are also carnivorous. These unusual plants have fascinating features to attract, trap, and kill their their prey. These features include special leaves that snap shut when trigger hairs are touched and sticky sub substances that trap insects when they land on the plant's leaves. So that actually comes from uh, Margaret McCowan's rave program, you know, to teach the word feature. So that's their, their context. Um, so another thing is, to, is when you teach the context, it's just put in a friendly definition. So like Collins Dictionary Online is a really good dictionary. Like I don't go to anything else. I think that's the best one out there. It puts it in nice student friendly ways. Like features are interesting or impart, important parts of something. So, you know, giving it in context, explaining it in a friendly definition and you're kind of moving pretty quick. Like this isn't, you don't want to take, you know, 30 minutes to, to, to teach one word because you're just not going to have enough time to teach everything else during the day. Um, so I'll do some of that, in, um, like at the start, um, I like to put pictures as well. So pictures, you know, um, you'll, you'll hear throughout this, um, we're in, in Western New York, we're big Bills fans. Like we, we live <laughs> in like, the, the Bills are like, they're, is that why you delineated to... where you were from so that you could talk <laughs> about this right now? That, that like Western New York. <laughs> Well, well, ge geography people like not not everyone knows ge like geographic, you know, geography. I know, super I'm just well. teasing you. Like, it's a seven hour drive to New York City, so <laughs> we're, we're pretty far. I'm closer um, to New York City than you I know, me too. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, like, it might be that day or the next day. Like, I'll put, I could even put it like, um, you know, because a lot of times the boys dig this up, the girls too, but like, yeah, I'll put a picture up on like Josh Allen because he's our, he's our star quarterback. And like, what are the features that Josh Allen has that makes the Bills successful? And it's like something that's a little different. And then the kids on their mini whiteboards can like, you know, write things down and we could have a really quick, like, two minute, you know, share about the features of Josh Allen, you know, because we just talked about the features of the pitcher, you know, the pitcher plant, those are different. So it's a different context. Um, or, or you could tie like a video, like usually with, with, with that, with, um, with a Venus flytrap, I'll put like a little YouTube video up for about two minutes that kind of shows the Venus flytrap in action. And the kids, while they're watching, I want them to write down what are the different features so they, they could actually see it. So I think that's pretty powerful. Um, you know, I think then it gets into their long-term memory a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so those are like, you know, to start, you know, like initial instruction, those are, are, are some of the main things, you know, student-friendly definition in context, pictures, even a short video if it's handy, you know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, those, you know, um, those work. Um, and it carries over, like, when when you talk, like, we, we do um, geography of the United States, like, features comes up a lot, like, ooh, what are the features of the mid-Atlantic region? So it's a different context that the kids now, it's like, oh, you know, big cities, oh, there's part of the Great Lakes, and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it just, it's, you know, it comes all over the place there. Yeah. Uh, can I also reinforce something? We talked about this with Nancy Hennessy, and... When this podcast comes out, that podcast will not yet be out. But listeners, <laughs> you can listen for that coming soon. Um, one thing that we talked about with Nancy is the idea of teaching something all at once versus teaching something over time. And so I think this is like a really specific example of that. Like you're not teaching everything that kids need to know about this word features all at once, all at one time, like you're taking this word and you're giving them what they need to know in context or what they need to know for this text. And then you might be expanding it in 
a, a two minute, like really fun intro when they come in in the morning, right? Like I'm picturing the Josh Allen thing, like a morning yeah. work kind of thing, right? Like that's like a super engaging, fun fifth grade way to enter your, your Friday after a Thursday night football game or something. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, down the road in social studies, you are revisiting this word features again in a different context and kids are continually adding and like Velcroing features, features, features. Oh, okay. Now I have like a bigger definition of it. The reason why I bring this up is because we get this question so often from listeners. And I think mm-hmm. like, I think teachers like do this in a super well-meaning way, but it's like almost like makes more work for yourself where you try to teach everything at once. And then like, like you align, right? Your social studies content mm-hmm. to your, to your ELA content, to your whatever content. And then you teach everything at once, but like, it doesn't really give time to digest. And like, in fact, what Nancy said is like, that's kind of not how we learn, but right. Like when we think about how we learn in life. Um, so I'm wondering if, if either of you wanted to react to that or, or share what your thoughts on that. It just is making me think like, Oh gosh, like now this makes me like rest assured that I don't need to put everything in line. I can just teach as things come up with some explicit instruction and as they're in context and, and we're going to get that, that knowledge, that Velcro for those vocabulary and, and the background knowledge that kids need over time. So curious for you both to react to that. Um, so you want to go, I could go. Uh, so go ahead, go ahead. For the, um, I would say that has, you make a, a, a brilliant point over the last, I would say probably five, six years, I've changed dramatically where I'm spreading things out, just like like you said. Like I think if with with the word feature here, I, I think about five six years ago, I would have tried to do like all these many things all at once, and instead of spreading it out over time, like the Josh Allen example, or you know even like showing the video of the Venus flytrap, um, I, I generally now do it separate times because it's like. It's quick, but then, it, like the kids, you're right, they digest it. Then they have to retrieve because they might have forgot a little bit. You know, forgetting is important, you know, in some regards. <laughs> um, so but we, I know we won't get into all the science of learning things, but like, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's really important. It's going to stick for the long haul if you do, if, if you do break it up over time. Yeah, sure. I was going to say, it can almost feel overwhelming, I would imagine, as a you know, a student who's just learning a word, I'm going back to now to your contract and contract, right? Like if you try and throw all those different ways to use that word at me at one time, I could just imagine my brain being like, I can't, (laughs) I can't take all that in. But if you give me one at a time and I go, okay, this makes sense. And then like, you know, however long later you come up and you're like, actually, here's another way that that word can Mm -hmm. be used. And you're like, oh, (laughs) I can add that to it, to the, you know, like you said, Lori, to the Velcro, right? Like I can add something to it. And it doesn't feel as overwhelming for me as a student. And also you brought up Sean to the time, (laughs) you know, then you're not spending 45 minutes on one word (laughs) in a class either. Yeah. Cause you you just don't, you just don't have the time to do that. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it does feel messier. I'll say that. It feels messier not to be like, check, we're done with function or um, we're with feature, <laughs> you know, like, but it's, I, I think that that's just something that we have to deal with as ELA teachers, you know, it's, it, me- it's messier. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. It's not like math. It's, 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 it's really hard. Like I, you know, it's hard, like when you're in the trenches, like to like planning wise, like you know, to think about like, oh, I'm going to do this the next day and to plan that out. That's not, that's definitely not easy and it takes time. You know, I'm not even close to being where I want with vocabulary, but, you know, I would say over the last five or six years, every year, I feel like I'm getting, you know, slowly better at it and things like that. And the kids are learning more, but, you know, it, 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 it's planning and it's time and how to, you know, get people around the country on teams to kind of do that work together and that sort of thing. Cause you know, it's, Planning's, planning's not easy. Yeah. Sean, are there, I know we kind of took a little roundabout turn um, to go deeper into <laughs> yeah. one, one thing that we're talking about, but are there any other research-based methods you would like to share that have been working for you? I yeah. know um, in our pre-call you mentioned a couple others, and we're happy to link those yeah. in our show notes too. <laughs> I love using like continuums because there's like the English language, there's just so many words even compared to other languages. Like the amount of vocabulary that we have in our language, you know, far exceeds many other languages. And like the nuance between like words that mean very similar things, but there, but there's a little bit in like slight differences. Like, 
Um, this year was funny. Like we, I t we talked about smells this year, and we were te <laughs> and I, all at once we just kind of did a quick lesson on like things that don't smell that great. You know, we talked about unpleasant, offensive, knock, uh, you know, noxious, putrid, pungent. So in that lesson, we kind of did that all together. So it was more of not super in super in depth, but uh, you know, some of the kids picked it up right away because. Like after we did that lesson, not probably two hours later, one of the boys in the class farts, of course. Fifth <laughs> of grade, course. I was going to say fifth you know, grade. Go ahead. You know, <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't have much of that this year. But without like batting an eye, remember, one of the boys looks behind and he, he goes, well, that's that's right in between putrid and pungent. <laughs> so that's great. It's like, all right, he picked up on it. One quick lesson and he, he, he's I using it. In, Someone in got talk. the Velcro. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, you know, cool. so like putting words on continuums, like, you know, with like, you know, unpleasant, like, you know, that would be like at one end where it, it smells slightly bad, bad and putrid, like on the other end. So the kids can see like on sort of like a, a, a like a number line, the kids can see on a line where those words fall. Um, you know, some other things like notable, noteworthy, um, momentous and remarkable, like how to put those on a line as well. And like going back, sorry, I got to go back to the Buffalo Bills here. So, um, <laughs> you know, if the Buffalo Bills win the division, like, you know, that's, you know, notable. But, you know, if they win a playoff game, well, that's noteworthy. Like, ooh, you know, you know, w winning the AFC championship would be remarkable. And then, like, you know, talking with kids, you know, well, what would winning the Super Bowl be like? And they'll be like, oh, the kids would be like, oh, that would be momentous. Like, everyone in our, <laughs> our area would like, lose their minds. So those little nuances, I think, are really, really helpful um, because, you know, when you only have so much time and, you know, a lot of kids can pick up more than just, like, not just teach notable, but they can pick up those other words if, you know, you're doing some of those at the same time as well. So, yeah, I yeah, like that. And I'll throw out, Sean, too. I, I have a four, almost five-year-old now um, who we just we just did this last night, actually, with not anywhere near what you're doing with fifth graders, but he, he heard the word terrified. And so we talked about how, you know, if you're scared or terrified, you know, like, why would you be terrified over being scared? What would make you mm. more scared than just being scared? So even with your, your youngest students, you can you can do that kind of continuum. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I've for seen sure. teachers do this with... Um, the paint paint swatches, oh, yeah. the ki like the uh, color swatches, where it's like, um, for example, like no, you know, noteworthy might be a lighter color, but uh, like memorable or, or remarkable would be a darker color, and and you just kind of go up the continuum that way. I always think that's cute if you're looking for a fun idea, or I mean, a line is also fine, but I, <laughs> I, the colors I think are fun. I just saw a TikTok video where it was about an ELA teacher who was walking into a paint chips to get paint chips like that. And it was like, just trying to pretend like I'm a normal person getting, getting paint samples. <laughs> Taking 30 Taking paint chips <laughs> from Home Depot. <laughs> that is funny. Sean, anything else you want to add for uh, morphology or, or etymology or anything there? Oh, okay, I guess. Oh, um, sure. I mean, it... Can, let's, can I do one, one thing be, before we go on to my Oh, policy? gosh, please. So, I'm like, sorry. I don't want to skip. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no. I, I, one of the things I like is I, I call it odd one out where, like, so you want kids to be thinking about the words, like, not just, like, oh, a definition or that. So I'll, I'm going to get, I'll, I'll give you guys, we'll do a couple here if it's okay. I'll give you guys four words, and you tell me which one is, like, the odd one out of those four. Okay. Okay? All right? Okay. All right, here quiz, we go. Quiz time again. All right. Um, <laughs> Gl glum, blissful, jubilant, ecstatic. So that was glum, blissful, jubilant, ecstatic. All right, Melissa, we're going to say it on three. Ready? One, two, three. Glum. glum. Ah, so like, you know, I mean, you, you could do some of these. I, like I, I was a first grade teacher before. Like some of this you can easily do in primary grades, like if you if you taught some of those words. So then the kids like you can ask the, you know, the students like, oh, like what is the over like arching like theme or meaning here? And like that one's like happy or sad. And glum is like you're you're you're, you're sad. Um, I'll, I'll give you one one more um, disagree, quarrel, 
bicker, concur. Disagree, Ready? quarrel, bicker, concur. Ready? Mm-hmm. Concur. <laughs> concur. Concur. So agree, disagree, right? So like when, when you're talking about teaching words too, like every word does not, you don't have to spend like, you know, even initial instruction, you don't have to spend 10 minutes on every word. Like the word concur, I think my kids will know it without ever me teaching it because I just use it in everyday language. Like instead of just saying like at the start, like, ooh, do you agree with Joey? Do you concur? So trying to add in words to your speech, I think is really, really helpful because like as teachers and I and my my vocabulary, my language is it's not like I grew up with like this very, very high language. My language is av probably average at best, um, but I'm trying to do that more in the classroom. So the kids, by the end of the year, they know concur because I've used it as a scaffold. Do you agree? Do you concur? And I've never really spent much time teaching it. But by the end of the year, they know concur means to Take agree with someone. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so powerful to do all of, I know you're giving some, you're actually doing a really nice job, Sean, I will say of like giving examples that are connected to text and then giving examples that are like relatable examples. So I appreciate that. And I just think these are so like, even the ones you, you, you just listed off, right? The glum, blissful, jubilant, ecstatic. I, I'm thinking we could connect those to text very easily, you know, depending on the text and what's happening. So I, I, I also appreciate like the first pass at being the real practical day-to-day -day example so kids can like wrap mm -hmm. their heads around those and then you know with that application to text especially for like you had said the ones that are a little bit more challenging bringing those in that connected space so that they can really understand and deeply understand those, yeah. those words like you know I'm going back to number of the stars or, or the text that you gave like you know is glum enough? No, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, yeah. how are we then deepening that, that even, even more so. So I, I, I appreciate the examples that you're giving. Yeah. Like the number of the stars, like a quick, another quick example, like the word procure came up in one of the, one of the articles, like that's a hard word, but you know, they've already know, and they've already learned obtain and acquire. Well, procure, you're getting something too, but it's usually harder. So like you, that, that word was used in like, there was a scarce there. Some items were scarce. They, they were hard to get in, Den, in, in Denmark at the time. So like, but that word it was never it was never in my lesson plan to teach like at great length. But you know, but the kids like they love it. Like one of the kids right away is like, "That's a great word. Can can we add it to our board?" And he's like, "I want my name on it." So he has <laughs> so that student uh, Cam has his name on the word procure forever because he wanted that added to the board. So All right, what board? What what do we have in our room, classroom here for a vocabulary uh, so board or? <laughs> I, I do well th this summer is going to be a little work so the kids really like words like so I'm not a big I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy elementary teacher I'm not big with putting things up like I'm not I don't like I don't I don't I don't spend time putting things up except I do like putting vocabulary words up on my one sidewall so like a lot of the words I know that we're going to come up you know this year like this year I'm, I'm gonna put them up all in alphabetical order at the start of the year the kids wanted to be in alphabetical order it was helpful they said so I probably am gonna have a little over a thousand words up on the sidewall just uh, and you can't laminate the words so don't laminate them. do not laminate them because the sun <laughs> reflects so, yes. all right pro tips here pro Good tips advice. thank yes. you yeah. So then the kids can, the kids have, have, you know, they, they, they can look the kids, the kids, it, it, it's helpful with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I bet that's helpful too, with like digging into like the morphology and etymology, cause you can visually see like the words that have similar parts. Right. Ah, uh, geez. We haven't even, we haven't even, uh, we didn't even plan this out. Um, we didn't. So on, on the words, what I'll do, like with the word contract, I'll underline on the on the index card. I'll underline track and, and small right under it. I'll I'll write drag or pull. So mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of those words that have like roots, prefixes, or suffixes that like make sense that aren't too abstract, um, I'll write it on the cards as well. So like getting back to the word like contract, if you want to move on to morphology, um, we'll talk about the root tract. 
Um, and I actually like to do it's called morphology mate it's a morpho, it's morphological matrixes. There's there's online, I think it's Neil Ramsden, he has a there's a link where you can make them yourself. So um, and it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to kind of figure it out and then it's super easy. Um, so like the word track, like you know, um, you, you can talk about like, oh, extract. Oh, like so we have we have we have we have contract, but extract, oh, you know, you're pulling, you know, you extract a tooth, you're pulling a tooth out, or retract, you're pulling something back. Even the word subtract, well, you're pulling something down. Mm -hmm. um, so those are like, then we'll take time. I'll definitely take probably five, 10 minutes, you know, on that route and like showing like the matrix. So, oh, for, well, like I can actually show for the, like I have this right here. So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then the kids can like look and they can build words themselves before you talk about it. So then the kids are like oh, motivated. Fine. Oh, you know, like, oh, oh, I know that word. Like, you know, you know, distract, you know, like, oh, your, your attention is getting pulled away. So then the kids will make the words and then, you know, I'll give them like two minutes. Make as many words as you can think and let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever have them work together or or just independently yeah, or so, I'm sure you so, mix it up maybe? I don't know. Yeah. So like um, I'm not like I have to be honest, I'm not a big um, like group group teacher where, you know, kids are working in four to five groups. I love partnerships. Um, so I have one for you where, you know, everyone does think, pair, share. I like this one where it's 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 think, write, pair, rewrite, share. Uh, so not as catchy, but go ahead, gonna, explain it's, why. It's catchy. You got to say it a couple of times, but so this is coming from so many whiteboards. Craig Barton in the UK is uh, one of my favorite math people, and you know, getting the kids okay, think for for you know thirty seconds, then write, then pair, discuss what you both wrote about. Then the kids have the opportunity to rewrite because you know sometimes in the pair like. One kid does all the work and another student maybe doesn't know that, like didn't know that much about that topic or what, but that student then has a chance to rewrite and then we can share. So I, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Mini whiteboards. Mm -hmm. I'm a big mini whiteboard guy. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. I, it's so I think it helps like plug another plug for mini whiteboards. It helps make thinking visible. That is, that has been previously invisible. I, I always loved that. Yeah. Yeah, I like I just like many whiteboards because the ratio where you're like, you know, when I first started teaching, you know, like you call on like I would call on the kids with their hands up. So you realize at the end of the year, well, the four or five kids, well, they had a lot of opportunities and the quiet kids sort of didn't. And with many whiteboards, the ratio is it's 100 percent participation. So uh, um, I, I, I just I, I find that it, it just works a lot, except in vocabulary, it works great. For sure. Yeah. And that's nice, too, because they can, you know, their their answer doesn't have to be final. You know, when you write, somehow, when kids write things on a paper, <laughs> it feels final yeah. to them. But, you know, this gives them an opportunity, like, just we're playing a little, you know, like, what do you think this means? And chat about it, change it. It's, you know, it's, it's it makes it a little more like a curiosity driven mm -hmm. versus like you have to get the right answer and write it on your Right paper. or wrong. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point, Melissa. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. many whiteboards are great. Just like even like when we talk about like little things to do, like say, you know, your lesson ended, you have five minutes. And instead of like, you know, sort of wasting that time, I'll just have the kids take out many whiteboards. OK, like I did this like I did this probably about mm, 30 to 40 times this year where, OK, someone pick a topic. It's really quick. And someone will say like plant. So it's, it's a topic that a lot of times we've been working on. And OK, write sentences as many as you can in your wipe off board like complex sentences that are using the vocabulary words that we've like learned so far this year so they're working on academic vocabulary working on tier two words within the context of like a you know a content area that we we're learning right now or we've learned like maybe last month so like one day i actually had the kids then i, I typed some of their their answers down 
it, it was great. Like we, we talked about plants and, you know, one person wrote, well, plants not only are crucial, vital, essential, and integral to life, they also manifest glucose for everything on earth to consume. Like, wow. Stop it's it. It's very cute. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, well, we Manifest do like a tap- glucose. Can we yeah. just like pause right there? Yes, yeah. which is <laughs> technically perfectly correct, but it's, you know, it's good. Like manifest is a great word, but, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's super cute. Like, you know, the Venus flytrap devoured or consumed the naive fly. Oh, like, wow. you know, that's, that's really cool. Like using the word naive in there within science. So, and that's say, you probably a, didn't teach them naive within the science. No, naive <laughs> was within our, our literature units. Yeah, so that's nice. That's a nice crossover. <laughs> yeah, so it's just something that, like, you know, it's five minutes. It's a retrieval activity, so it's another opportunity for kids to practice some of the words. Um, you know, it's not taking. You know, it just it's not taking all day. But like the kids really like that because they try to beat their score. Like, how many mm-hmm. words can we get? So then they try to like. You know, they try to like that's doing it got crucial, vital, essential in one sense because like, oh, I can get more points for that. You know, like, you know, it's cute. I love it. (laughs) Well, Sean, you already brought this up, but I'm going to circle back to it, which was there are so, so many words. I, I forget. You might know the numbers, but there's like a certain number of words that kids are supposed to learn every year, which is like beyond what any teacher could ever actually Mm -hmm. teach explicitly. Um. If you know them, feel free to share <laughs> how many, if you don't know, that's okay. Um, but we're curious how you, how do you go about, you know, teaching or not even teaching, but getting kids to learn these other words that are beyond the ones that you're teaching explicitly? Yeah, I think I, I, this is, this is hard. Like as a classroom teacher, this is hard. It's, it's, it's trying to embed as many words in language throughout the day as possible. So if you don't think about it, it's it's not it's it, it, it's not easy. Like even like um, like more, when we talk about morphology, when we're talking about words, um, I would say six seven years ago, I could not teach the morphology like I do now because I just didn't know all the roots that I should have like that as a teacher in fifth grade I should know. So at one point I I had to pra- like I practiced and I just learned and I picked it up. Now when things come up, I can't like, it's a lot easier for me to do a minute like, oh, th- you know, this route or that, um, where it might not be right in the lesson plan. Um, it's, and it, it's just, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of talk th- throughout the day, like, you know, using co- concur for agree in those instances. Or um, like even, even when kids, like when kids, you want kids to do better, like say for writing. Like kids aren't writing as sophisticated sentences as you want. Like I remember joking around with one student. I'm like, I these sentences are are you know they're they're, they're fine. They're concise. You know they're short. You know they make sense. But I don't want concise sentences. I want them to be more sophisticated. You know I want you to expand on these, elaborate more. Um, so you know he I remember that day. It's a, a really good student, but he just. He wasn't big on writing that day, but like just joking around with vocabulary, it kind of changed the tune. And like later that day and the next day, I, he made like these most elaborate, sophisticated sentences in his writing. Because I think we joke because because I'm like, oh, you know, we don't want concise sentences, you know, with the whole class. So that sort of thing. Um, but you have to like look at words at the start of the day, and I think it's like baby steps. Once you start doing better. It kind of snowballs and you get better at it and then it snowballs. So it, you know, it, it takes time. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. I'm wondering about the, um, you, you mentioned like the one student who picked out a word and wanted his name on it. Do you have kids that kind of like look out for new words as they're reading or? Yeah. yeah. So like, I mean, I don't, so in, in bringing words to life, they've used uh, the word wizard, which I, I haven't like used formally where kids can go home and you know find the words that they've like they've just learned and they get points for like bringing those words and i've never like done that formally um but what i like to do is so i have a like an improvers board where they they move up levels throughout the year throughout like the year and a few students every year will get to the highest level called living legend and they get their picture taken and 
their picture stays in the classroom until I retire. So there are some <laughs> students amazing. who work just really hard because like I want my picture on the board and it's all based on improvement and kind of effort. So it's not that, you know, you're, you know, the student that does the best or, you know, you get the highest grades and that sort of thing. Um, but like kids will push themselves like amongst each other to like use more words, especially in writing. Um, I push the writing, no matter what we're writing about, there's always a reminder about vocabulary. And I like to show in the document reader, um, like, you know, really like good sentences or good thoughts, but also when kids use, you know, sophisticated words in, in their writing on the document camera. So it's kind of like showing good models and kids really love that. Um, the, like the document reader is just, it's amazing to, to do a kind of show call with that. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, I feel like we're all going to come to your Ted talk. I want to know more about this effort thing, but it, I, I, I really, I would love to like record a separate podcast about that as a bonus at some uh, point. <laughs> That's neat. Uh, I like that. Beautiful. Well, one last thing we wanted to chat with you about was your data. You mentioned it earlier about the, your data improving. And I know vocabulary can be tough <laughs> when you're talking about data. You know, it's not, yeah. <laughs> it's not easy to like, yeah. put a number on someone's vocabulary. <laughs> so yeah. curious how you go about using data and seeing improvement for students. So um, data-wise, like, like vocabulary is hard because like, you know, you have oral reading fluency, that's easy to measure. You could do that three times a year. You can see the progress for reading fluency. Um, for vocabulary, it's a little tougher. Um, now, I've been using some academic, like m multiple choice, um, just um, tests that I found online. So I kind of use it as a pre-post test measure. Um, also, our district, we, we use iReady. And iReady has, um, I mean, it's widely used. It, it's basically, Test just general reading skill, but it has a vocabulary subtest. Um, in in the research, it's usually really hard on a on a test like that to see huge improvements in vocabulary because, you know, it could be totally different words that are tested than words that you've taught. Um, but the the data has shown, uh, like this year, I think as a class, we've made about two hundred and fifty percent growth in vocabulary, which is a hundred percent as average. So wow. it's showing on standardized tests, which I'm really, really excited about. And um, like even on state tests, I'm waiting for those scores to come in. I have a, I, I have a good hunch that, uh, especially this year, that those scores compared to how they did last year, the same students are going to rise dramatically. So, yeah. So like I'm just I'm excited about the data just to to, to see like it is it it, it, se it seems to be it seems to be working. Yeah. We we didn't talk about we didn't talk about one uh, one thing about fluency and, and I'm trying to, to do we have a minute to do uh, to absolutely okay so because <laughs> teachers we are we especially like, if it's I, about fluency okay so <laughs> op, when I when I teach when I think about teaching opportunity costs like you only have so much time so you you every decision that you make you're actively making a decision what not to teach as well so. With, with vocabulary, I think it's really good to embed vocabulary into fluency. So, um, like, I'll use, like, passages from the Reading Reconsidered or other curriculums that we use in, in our district. Um, or I, what I did this year is I did a lot of chat GPT where I created my own fluency passages based on the topic that we were learning. And with that, um, you can embed whatever vocabulary words you want. So then you're not waiting for like the word concur to come up like when you don't know when it's going to come up you can say "Ooh, add concur to this passage so they have more so <laughs> yeah so like fluency this year i probably in fifth grade like at least every other day we've we read fluency passages as part i just do it simple as partner as partnerships i'm um, rereading um, but next year it's definitely going to be daily um, for sure, because I because I, I saw huge fluency gains, almost two years of growth in one year this year in fifth grade. Um, yep. So embedding those vocabulary within fluency passages, you, you might as well do that. Um, you, yeah. It just saves so much time. It's a twofer, right? Two for one. Yeah, yeah. with the, well, it's almost that. a three. 
three for one three because <laughs> then, then it, it could be in in the like the science or social content so in the science and social content embedding vocabulary words and having the kids you know reread those passages i think it's it, it, it's very very powerful yeah ah yeah. uh, that's amazing and that's such an easy thing like less than five minutes right for Classroom time, per se. Fluency. Yeah. So, like, yeah. I mean, even, even like, planning time's hard, but, like, you know, I know chat GP kind of blew up a little bit. Like, there a lot of, like, the one thing I found it really easy to do is just really quickly do that. So, I mean, it took, like, planning time was, like, three or four minutes. Fluency with the kids are talking, you know, five, six minutes to reread a passage three times, discuss, you know, vocab words and that sort of thing. Yeah. Sean, do you want to close us out here by sharing that correlational data in terms of academic vocabulary and state assessment results? Yeah. So it, it, it's kind of crazy um, where the vocabulary data that um, on the on tests that, that are just like multiple choice that are testing academic vocabulary words um, with state test data, the correlation was like 0.84. And... One, uh, one, so from last year, one student score is kind of skewed a little bit. If, if I took that student out, it would have been 0 0.91. So like, it's crazy, like academic vocabulary, like a hundred question multiple choice test correlated basically perfectly with the state test. So, I mean, when, when like kind of moving away from like in some balanced literacy things like in grades three through five, it was tons of like, you know, talking about find the main idea and that sort of thing. Well, maybe instead of doing that, like at great length, we should teach words at much more. <laughs> like, and, that, and that's, and so far, um, I, I, I spent more time probably than the average teacher with vocabulary, um, but the results are sort of backing that up. So as you know- Yeah, because my, you were my, building my knowledge results, too, right? Yeah, like I, I just think it yeah. seeps over into each other. I mean, you're playing with words, you're building knowledge, you were filling in huge gaps, you're doing it in the context of ELA, social studies, science, like so many things that, you know, we talk about all the time on this podcast. Yeah, and you can, and at the start of the year, within like the second week of school, you do an oral reading fluency, like I use Acadians, um, and, you know, you do some pre-test for academic vocabulary. You, I, I have with quick testing a pretty good snapshot of the kids who are going to need extra interventions and the kids who are going to probably need more repetitions to vocabulary words for sure you know the, you know so and the kids who are are their their depth and breadth is 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 not as much so i know right away you know which those which kids those are right at the start of the year yeah well, Sean, we cannot thank you enough for sharing all of these great tips with us. Um, I know we saw you on Twitter sharing a lot of tips. Do you want to share your Twitter handle so other people can uh, sure. follow yeah. you for great That's tips? The only, I'm not on Facebook or anything, so I, I, think it's, I think it's at S. Morrissey on Twitter, Sean Morrissey. So at S. We'll Morrissey. We'll check it. Wait, right. Sean, where, where are we going to link it? Oh, on I'm the setting. show notes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go sean twitter in the show notes All right. here we go um, yeah, yeah i think follow like, him if you want more yeah i think <laughs> i'm trying to get a like I, I don't think i did it that much because i'm not i don't i don't i'm not sure i'm not big on tweeting in that but like moving away from sort of the you know arguments in that because i think oh, yeah. we're kind of past that like people aren't like if certain people they're not going to like um, you know, when I started posting some vocabulary things just online and I don't have a big following, but like, oh, a lot of people like started to follow that. And I, I see, oh, this is what teachers want. They want to know like how to apply in the classroom. Right. Like they've, they've heard, they like, they, 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 they kind of know the pedagogy now, like now how to get to the other part, which is, it's not easy. It's definitely yeah. not easy. Yeah. And that's what no. I, I mean, that's what caught my eye with yours was like, you, you're like, I did this today. I, I tried this with my class today. <laughs> you know, mm. it just was, it's just so nice to hear that. Like, you know, this is what I did in my classroom. <laughs> yeah, you're putting yourself yeah. out there. So people have been nice. Like, you know, if you, when you put yourself out there sometimes, but people have been great about it. So, yeah. I, I, we love hearing it. And we love, thank yeah. you for sharing with our audience as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Pleasure to be here. I had so much fun.